By the power of Grayskull, I'm Lux. For the honor of Grayskull, I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on she and the Princesses of Power, Episodes 1 and 2. So we'll start off with your comment. All they had to do was not call it she <laughs> And that would have fixed everything. But let's just remove that for now. <laughs> and go with impressions? Okay, completely ignoring everything about the 80s one and studying it as its own show. First episode was a little rushed. I mean, we got the she transformation rather quickly there. But overall, as a two-parter, reasonable pacing. A lot of tension with Adora and Catra and Glimmer and wow, Bo is trusting. Yeah, Bo is very, um, like Sokka later in the Avatar series. Because at the beginning, Sokka was trusting no one. Then he kind of shifted later. He's definitely very the lighthearted version of Sokka. You know, all the crazy stuff. Yeah, considering he was outside of Princess Glimmer's window going, Glimmer! Hey, Glimmer! And speaking of Glimmer, I like the fact that the more power she used, the less shiny she got. Yes, yeah, so nice visual cue there. Also nice built-in limitations on powers, because she used up all her power. Well, pretty much all her power. We don't know how she will recharge a Bright Moon, but we know she's going to when they finally get back there. And Adora, every time she's done the whole She-Ra thing, has practically passed out. So there are some limits built in here. That's interesting. It's like, hmm, I don't remember She-Ra being limited. This is interesting. I wonder how they're going to do this and stuff like that. And then I remember a comment from one of the trailers. I'm with you guys because your friend can turn this nine foot tall. <laughs> yeah, she basically looks like a freaking Valkyrie goddess. I think that's kind of the point. Especially with that whole imagery when he when she saves Bo, Moon behind her or something, just like wow, nice goddess imagery. It's gonna be interesting to watch the rest of the show, and as you can tell, we're only doing the first two episodes. That we're gonna split it up how we feel later. Because there's only thirteen, and we know better. We've learned our lesson. It's not a good idea to do the entire season of something as a single podcast you can go back through our archives and see how long those were you'll get our thoughts along the way and we'll eventually get back to some of the other shows we're doing yes we got plenty going right now don't worry we'll get back to them and finish them up we just want to take our time on things also we both were like kind of excited to watch this show just to see how good or bad it was because i ignored pretty much all of the stupidity online about this thing because it's both sides are being idiots right now. Oh my god. It's a freaking show, man. I'm sure it is. I've stayed away from it as well. But if we're going to... Uh, only a couple minutes in, I was going to try to evaluate the show on its own. But okay, let's bring back the 80s. <laughs> the problem is you're messing with people's childhood. Now, a lot of cartoon reboots do a really good job and get a nice solid audience. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. DuckTales. Voltron, Legendary Defender, all really great. But there's this core in the female being. <laughs> She-Ra was ours. She had everything. She had the unicorn. She had the sword. She had super strength. She could talk to animals. Her sword was a magical MacGuffin that could turn into anything. She was cooler than Superman because she could do more stuff than him. <laughs> Seriously, she can do more than Superman. Did I, did I remember to mention she has healing powers? She's like a female Jesus. And I'm standing by all of that. I'm not letting Lux edit it out. Just to make sure, you, you meant Superman, not He-Man. Yes. Okay, just a double check there. Just to, I wanted to make sure. What, what can Superman do? He can fly. He's super strong. He's so strong, he's boring. What can she do? She's super strong. She has a sword that can turn into anything. She can heal. She can talk to animals. And she has a winged unicorn. <laughs> which in current vernacular is called an alicorn, which actually commonly refers to the horn. I think it's specifically when it's separate from the unicorn. Quite. So that is not a phrase that I tend to latch on to. 
All right, so when you're taking something so precious to the female psyche, you're gonna catch hell for it. And then there's me who goes, oh, hey, it's a new show. They're basing it off of um, the original Shira, and they're gonna do their own thing with it. Cool. I like the design. I'm okay with it. Because I've seen some people tearing apart She-Ra's current design. And I'm like, yes, she's not as feminine as the original. Big deal. Her hair is not as messy as you think it is. It doesn't blend in with the cape. Especially in motion. Those stills they released were from this first episode. They were stills. Animation has a tendency not to look good when you freeze frame it. There's this great example from the Smash Brothers series. Where you exaggerate stuff in animation when it's moving. But if you pause it at a certain frame with Samus, her body looked broken. But in motion, you don't see that because they use it to exaggerate the motion to give more power to the oomph to her attack. It's a classic thing in, an in animation. You call It's called stretching and bouncing. You over-exaggerate things to give people a more oomph to it. And it doesn't look good stills. So, yeah, of course there were problems with it in the still form. I'm like, duh, it's going to look better in motion. It's kind of like you can't tell a game by stills from it. You can barely tell, you can barely, you can barely tell a game from a trailer. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I found all this stuff that I've read. I was like, wow. I managed to avoid most of the spoilers in these discussions. I just looked at the general gist of like, oh, my God, you idiots. <laughs> Both sides. The people who like it, who don't like it, who, like... Jeez. It's like, why can't we just have a civil discussion about this? Yeah, because so far from these first two episodes, it's got a good start. It's got a solid base to it. Yeah, it does. And they'd probably be avoiding a lot of the explosions if they hadn't called it Chira, Because there's been tons of changes to the character design. There's been tons of changes to the story. And that's not even me having recently watched Chira. It's been at least two years since I've watched any episodes of she and longer than that since I've watched the pilot. Though I find it interesting we still kept the phrase, so where is Skull? Is it still back on Eternia? Because the first ones colonized Etheria, so they're not Etherian natives, which means she could entirely possibly be a descendant of the first ones, meaning she has a half-sib on Eternia, or at the very least, she has a male counterpart. Also, quick fun fact, all the writing on the walls is actual writing. They have a translation seat out for it, so you can actually read those ruins yourself. I would like to do that later. I'll see if I can't find it again. It was actually in one of my feeds, and I was like, I'm going to glance at that real quick and come back to it later because I don't want to be spoiled on anything. I want to go into this as blind as possible. And then you kept bumping into things. At least it's not as bad as, like, some of the stuff I've run into. It's like, oh my god, you almost spoiled me on... Let's see, what was it? I can't remember the show, but I was like, oh, whoa, nope, nope, nope. I was like, nope, I can tell, nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big important thing. I do not want to know about it. <laughs> That's another reason we're working on she right now is it's the hot current thing. It's harder to avoid spoilers on than... Ladybug or Steven Universe. And speaking of Steven Universe, pacing on that show, it's like the more I watch other shows and the more I watch it, I'm like, how is the pacing so good on Steven Universe? The episodes never feel like 11 minutes long. They always feel longer. And then you get to them, you're like, that, that's it? That That's it? <laughs> and you're not going, that's it, as in they left you hanging. You're going, that's it, and going, Oh, it's been 11 minutes. Okay. That's the, another thing is I've never felt like their episodes are rushed. Unlike the first episode of this um, pilot, I was like, wow, they're getting through stuff kind of quickly and they're kind of using characters to push certain story elements along a little forcefully. Ba bo, cough, bo. Um, he is definitely a force for plot in these two episodes. He does a lot of pushing things in a general direction. Like, trying to influence Glimmer, trying to influence Adora. Very much so. And, you know, because the entire thing in Thamor allowed Glimmer to start seeing Adora as a person when she was observing Adora's unguarded reactions. Which was kind of 
crazy and fun. They do they do a lot of the sparkly eyes in this show. Oh yes. And I'm perfectly okay with the style they're going for. Also, Shadow Weaver is scary. They are doing a really good job with her. Cause she freaks me out. Well, I, I think she has a bit more going for her in this version than the original Shira. Just because at this point in original Shira, we would have seen Lord Hordak, but we've only seen Shadow Weaver. The cadets of Adora's squadron and faceless NPC soldiers. And another interesting thing about this series that's different from the original is the fact that so far everyone knows who she is. There is no secret identity that's very clearly delineated in the title sequence of She-Ra and He-Man. If you watch them side by side, are basically identical. They say all of the same things. Only these three people know my secret. Yeah. In certain situations, having the secret identity makes sense. Ladybug, cough. In certain situations, not so much because what did Adora in the 80s version have to gain by being both Adora and She-Ra? She wasn't trying to do a double life of sneaking around still acting like she belonged to the Horde and being a spy, she was still a rebel fighter as Adora. And speaking of the whole Horde thing, I really like that she definitely has conflict about it. And I hope they keep that conflict in her, even though she's like, yeah, this is evil, but they did raise me and all. I really would like to see her stay conflicted and not just when she's facing Katra. Because that's going to be hard because the two of them grew up together and have always pretty much had each other's backs. But we see differences between them because Catra has never striven as hard within the armies. And she stated very clearly to Adora that, yeah, they've been messing with us our whole lives. I just want what I want out of it. She just wants to get out, apparently. Probably because she knew about the manipulations. And she had like uh, an urge to get out of there, change things, and come back. But right now I think she changed her plan a little bit because it sounds like she wants to change things from the inside. Well, you know, she's been out of the fright zone for a whole two seconds compared to Adora's two minutes. She hasn't had a chance to see much of the other side. And if Shadow Weaver and the Horde are going to give her things that she wants then, yeah, she'll continue to fight on the Horde's side. She isn't going to throw away everything she's known her entire life just because her best friend, who she believes ditched her, is changing sides. If anything, that's a reason plot-wise to become bitter and forceful and be leading all of the Horde raids. Yeah, we're going to see what happens when she gets back. It looks like Shadow River's probably going to already know what's going on. Which is interesting because I could have sworn Shadow Weaver can't scry into the Whispering Woods. Also, the Horde soldiers shouldn't have been able to make it that far into the Whispering Woods. The Woods hate the Horde soldiers and rearrange the entire thing. So unless they're taking all the trees down on their way in, the forest should have remazed around them and they would be totally lost. Because that's how the Whispering Woods work. It sounds like it does do that. Yes, but it doesn't sound like it does it in the plot convenience way of the 80s version, where only the Horde soldiers would get lost and the trees would move specifically to confuse the Horde soldiers, but left the villagers and the rebels alone. We'll see. This is only the first two episodes, and we've got little bits and pieces of backstory and future stuff going on. Like, the whole flash of information we got when Adora touched the sword and... The second time I think she touched the sword. The whole thing with Light Hope, I'm like, okay, so is Light Hope like the spirit of the sword? Is Light Hope another less damaged hologram like the one in the refuge that they were in? Also, uh, an image that stuck in my head that probably also you caught as well in those flashbacks was something crashing to the planet. So I'm like, that's probably a Dora instead of a capsule or something. Like I said, like Superman, but better. Yeah, so I'm like, 
I think that's going to be Adora when we like get more clearer images and more stuff set up for that. Well, that could be Adora. That could also be the reason that the first ones left is to deal with that crash or because of that crash. Hmm. Because no one's seen them for a thousand years. So if no one's seen them for a thousand years, and if Adora is a full-blooded one, how did she get there? Hmm. Has she been in stasis for a thousand years until Shadow Weaver found her? Interesting. Especially if they bother to introduce He-Man in their own way. See, and that's another complication of keeping it She-Ra. If they just made this a whole warrior princess thing with tech versus magic, there's probably 40 animes about that. Well, it actually sounds like tech is magic. They actually described She-Ra's sword as a kind of like a technical magical item. Yes, but Glimmer specifically says she's using magic and that she's running out of magic. I'm just saying that they described Shira's sword as like a technical thing. Well, based on everything we've seen, it belonged to the first ones, which was a highly advanced technological race. That's entirely different than Glimmer's princessness. And in this day and age, it was probably a good thing that they took the queen's angel wings and gave her a different type of wing. Also, so far, it looks like Adora doesn't quite have full conscious control when she's She-Ra. No, she doesn't entirely know what's happening. But when you see the way she acts, some of it still has to be her. Because she didn't harm any of the soldiers. She just disabled the weapons and blocked their blows. She didn't harm anyone. And when she first transformed in front of the bug, the bug just went, oh, she ra gotcha, and chilled out because she was awesome with animals. That's kind of what I was thinking when you started bringing up all those. Her entire bag of tricks. Yep. Though, um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about the original because I don't remember it that much. I did watch it, but I don't remember it that much. What did Shadow Weaver actually look like in the 80s version? And what were her power set? She was a red-robed figure, and you never saw her face. Shadow Weaver. She looked like a shadow wearing a robe. Ah. And other than the scrying, I don't really remember, because all of the episodes I watched recently, she wasn't in. I I'm going to have to go watch at least the pilot before we watch more episodes. Hmm. How do you feel about the changes to Katra and Adora. Personality wise, I think it gives them more depth, but I'm not so sure about Katra's physical character design changes because Katra's mask was her power. It was stolen from a magical cat tribe and tainted by her evil. So we're like losing entire plot points here. Because she was entirely human and changed to entirely feline for battle. And in that way, had some similarities to She-Ra. You have the magical MacGuffin and you had a transformation. Hmm. What do you think about the changes to Glimmer and Bo? Bo is all sorts of improvements. <laughs> because the original Bo didn't have much depth to him. Because he was a male character in a predominantly female series. In She-Ra, there was basically She-Ra and everyone else. I do like that line where he goes, You're all princesses here! I think I'm actually the only one who's not a princess. <laughs> so that's kind of another Sokka-style tieback. He's, you know, because Sokka was the only one who wasn't a bender. Mm. So yeah, he, he's striking a lot of Sokka notes with me. But I, I'm liking the little touches we're getting of personality, like how he was putting all of Glimmer's stuff away in her room. Like the, which door does this go in again? The bottom. And also really good at pep talks. Mm-hmm. He laid it on thick. Oh, yeah. And Glimmer, I mean, other than looking much younger and shorter and stockier, than the other Glimmer. She also sounds younger than the 80s Glimmer. Hmm. And most of the 80s Glimmer's power was in her staff that recharged from light. Yeah, I remember that from one of the books we read. And despite being in book form, that was quite canon. 
yeah, we read a bunch of 80s uh, She-Ra books. We'll, we'll have to link that playlist for you here. Yeah, yeah, I'll put links to the playlist down below. Also, speaking of those particular books, which were golden books, apparently they are using the license once again, and they're releasing two new books, one for He-Man and one for She-Ra, both based on their origin stories. And both apparently based on the 80s version, not touching She-Ra and the Princesses of Power at this time. I'm sure that'll come later if they get greenlit for a second season because Golden Books makes Golden Books for everyone. And one of the books in our playlist is the uh, She-Ra origin story as told in book form. Yeah, a lot was like trimmed out of that. Well, it was, you know, like a 20 page Golden Book. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it was a lot to fit in. He-Man being told there's another sword and you have a sister and you have to go find her to running into the rebel group and joining up with them to getting taken out by Adora herself who then touches the sword and suddenly gets the revelation and instantly goes good and her white not brown horse spirit that she had while she worked for the evil horde transformed into the winged unicorn swift wind once she climbed onto his back after she was transformed into Shira. That brown horse may be Swift Wind. We don't know. That brown horse is very likely going to be Swift Wind if they're sticking with Swift Wind having a transformation from spirit to Swift Wind. If it's just a winged unicorn, she could find it in the Whispering Woods, maybe. Hmm. But if it's transforming, that's going to be the horse that transforms. Also, her reaction when first seeing a horse apparently was like golden. <laughs> Almost every young girl ever. I didn't want to say that out loud, but it was, it's what I was thinking. <laughs> I, I wanted to leave that to, for you to say. <laughs> a little safer if the female in the conversation says it. Yeah, because I, I looked over at you right when her, she was reacting like that, and you were like, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, one, it's a horse. It sounds like she would have never seen a large quadruped herbivore. Because, I mean, look at the fright side. Nothing's going to live there. Yeah, and apparently they never had birthday parties or parties, period, which kind of makes sense. Not just because they're the evil whore, but because they're a mi military. And if they're a super strict military and if they're manipulating their people, stuff like parties and birthdays, not important. Any expression of individuality or freedom, not so much. And just to be fair, there are plenty of girls who never went through a horse phase. But for those of us who did, or are still going through one, <laughs> yes, it's it's really awesome when all you, you have to do is pet the horse or brush the horse or ride the horse. L less fun if you have to clean the horse's water bucket, muck the horse's stall. All the actual maintenance of caring for your very expensive herbivore quadruped. There is a reason our parents always said no when we asked for horses and ponies. Oh yeah. You think it's hard taking care of a dog or a cat? Wait until that dog or a cat is the actual size of a horse. I had one of those. Not a horse, mind you, but a dog the size of a horse. The size of a Shetland pony. <laughs> Still, he was huge. Yes, and... Not quite a Shetland pony. <laughs> one, one of those miniature ones. Uh, if you remember the commercial from a few years ago, they play some share song, Little Lamb, and the woman orders a gigantic pet door online so the little horse can come into the house. About that size. Ah, uh, another fun thing about my dog. He thought he was the size of a small cat. Well, that's also because he thought he was a cat. Yes, he would attempt to purr. I believe I've mentioned him before, but hey, moving on back to the Shira episode, anything else in particular you'd like to go over or compare or go, oh, I like that. Well, uh, something that we both commented on in the trailer, the vines taking Shira out when she's knocked off of the ship. I protest highly. Odds are that's going to break your neck and kill you. Because a sharp snap back to the neck is extremely deadly. So, so they could have like had it go across her chest 
or grab her arm in some way. Or even just they bump into something and she loses her balance and falls. But vine across the neck, no, because that would have snapped her head back. So unless being one of the first ones or whatever Adora happens to be gives you an incredibly strong neck, that probably would have killed her and there goes the whole series. Adora dies, Catra goes back to the Horde, eventually the Horde wins. Yeah, it's kind of like that whole thing where superheroes rescue people falling out of the sky and you're like, yeah, that doesn't work that way. Physics, man. Physics. The only superhero who ever encountered physics from a falling person and it ended badly for them? Spider-Man. He accidentally killed someone he was trying to save. Cause spiderweb to the chest. Snap! Ooh! Because the sudden stop of stopping here, the head went back. Yeah, not pretty. No, but apparently that's a little too much realism for Shira and the Princesses of Power who I wish I could remember all the names of, because there's Frosta and Castaspella, but I don't remember the water one. Castaspella. I wonder if they're going to change your name. Well, I don't think I actually caught Castaspella in the intro, because she was more magic-themed, Frosta was ice-themed, and Flora was plant-themed. I'm pretty sure I saw both of those in the intro, Frosta and Flora, because there was definitely a plant-based one, and there was definitely an ice-based one. Yes, they were both in there, and then there was a water-based one. And there was a kind of a technology-based one? Well, maybe they'll make that one cast a spell. Because hmm. there was a technology-type character, but she was a one-off. Well, like one in three. Uh, she was one of the spies on Double Trouble Island. Ah. Also, I wonder what they did with Madame Raz. And I'm just waiting for... Luki to show up, and then we have to go rewatch every episode, find where the heck he was hiding. <laughs> okay, who now? Is that that like giant eared thing? They came out at the end of the every episode and said, "Did you see me during the episode?" And they show the frame that he was in, and he gave the lesson at the end so that the show could be counted as educational content. <laughs> Just make sure the. The big wing thing that had rainbows, it looked kind of like his ears. Yeah, apparently we just did some looking, and I have no idea who she was talking about, because I was thinking of Cal. Uh, Cal and Lukey look nothing alike, seriously. Yeah, well, I, I didn't know who you were talking about, because I didn't remember him at all. Because apparently I have, like, very few memories of Shiva, even though I remember watching it. Especially since I believe it was on like right after He-Man all the time. They tended to kind of put them together. By the way, she's still looking at the images. Somehow looking at Luki led down a rabbit hole of a bunch of fan art and cosplays of Sweet Bee. Who know? Uh, okay. I have no idea who that is, but apparently it's a She-Ra Universe character. Oh, yeah. There, there were all, she was later in the series, like after they made 65 episodes for syndication. Hmm, I wonder how many of these characters they're going to bring in. Like Cal, for example, the person I was trying to remember. Cal, Madame Raz, I don't know, probably a few of these people. Let's just go for all the bug theme, bug and animal themed ones. Hmm. The butterfly one, the bee one, the peacock one. Going to be interesting. Okay, and... Sorry because you guys aren't getting to see these pictures, but that one's Castaspella by my thumb. Ah, oh, there was someone very similar to that. Kind of looks like she has a big shield or sun disc at her back. Hmm. Well, next time we watch this show, we have to have like have that image up and we can probably pick them out of the intro. Well, I think we can probably just use the wiki of she characters instead of me scrolling through a rabbit hole of images speaking of which should we get back to the uh episodes now uh we're still recording but i just dismissed the search <laughs> so far i'm liking where they're going with it there's definitely a lot of backstory and future stuff going on makes me interested makes me want to continue watching yeah, like I said, all they had to do was not call it She-Ra, and they probably would have missed out on most of the controversy. 
because I'm not sure about how I feel for this animation style for She-Ra, specifically for She-Ra. I'm okay with the animation style as a whole, but it doesn't scream She-Ra to me. Like, Glimmer doesn't scream She-Ra to me. She screams Wings Club. Hmm, I didn't quite get that feeling, but I can understand where you got that from. Best case scenario, Princess Guinevere and the Jewel Riders. Hmm, I was just thinking more anime in general, especially since if you really think about it, She-Ra was one of the first American magical girls. She had an animal. She had a magical transformation. She had superpowers. She like fought for love, friendship, and all that other stuff. So she's a classic magical girl. So when you basically take America's first animated magical girl, because I can't say first magical girl because we have Wonder Woman. Hmm. Yeah, I recently watched this nice video on uh, what classifies as a magical girl. <laughs> and near the end, they were pointing out like, yeah, well, technically some of the first magical girls in America were She-Ra. And the first actual magical boy was He-Man. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he was a magical boy. Like cute high Earth Defense Cup love. Only with less clothes, which is funny considering the hot springs. He-Man wore less clothes than She-Ra. Yes. Wow. And this was for kids. But like most cartoons from the 80s, it was designed to sell toys. I don't think this one's actually designed to sell toys, though there's probably going to be merchandising up the wazoo. I think a lot of kids' shows nowadays are actually with the premise first, or they take a premise. Like, you have to include these characters. Okay. And then they run with that. Well, I think Netflix series are in a different category altogether because Netflix gets its income from subscribers. So they're not doing a toy line. It's not like uh, the classic example, Hasbro. Hasbro primarily sells toys. If they do a TV series, it needs to sell toys. Why did the Thundercats reboot get canceled? Because the toys sucked and nobody bought them. And the DVD sales were abysmal. That's because the DVDs were garbage. They were half seasons with no bonus features. Mm-hmm. And they were really expensive. I, I mean, like, the price for one of their DVDs was like the price of a DVD set from other companies of similar series. And you're like, okay, I know this series was really freaking expensive to produce, but this is ridiculous. Because I found out recently that that Thundercats was one of the most expensive shows at the time to produce. Well, it had great production values. See, that was another reboot of an 80s cartoon where I was thrilled. Yes, I know there were ten to, tons of changes to the character design. I don't care. I was thrilled. I rewatched Thundercats in its entirety as an adult. The original 80s version. The reboot was amazing. I didn't care. Yeah, and the, and the reboot's amazing. You know, it was a really nice job. Well done. They were getting a little bit on the power curve side, a little bit on the high side, but it was good. And apparently they had a, they already had the next season written out, but they were canceled before they could actually start producing it. Because the toys were horrible. I couldn't bring myself to buy them on clearance. That's how bad they looked. And neither of us could really justify purchasing the DVDs. Especially not in half-season sets when we could buy the entire season of something else that one was a full season and two had bonus features. The big advantage to buying something is having the bonus features, the behind the scenes, the music videos, the textless intros and outros, you know, the outtakes, the storyboards, the concept art, because anything else you can just watch online or on TV. I really wish they gave us a way to support that show back then that was reasonable. But we should get back to She-Ra. <laughs> yes. It's just it was another show I really liked the reboot of, but the company had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> but it's an interesting contrast. I was totally cool with almost everything they did. It, Panthera's redesign was a little rough for me, but Panthera's original design didn't make a lot of sense in the Thundercat pantheon, so. Man, I missed that reboot. Especially with the reboot they're trying to do right now with it. Ugh, we do not speak of that. Yeah, I have no idea if it's actually still going on because it, like, major fan backlash on that one. 
Yeah, we do not speak of it. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how many episodes we have to get in before we see everything that we saw in the trailers. Mm. Because the reveal in the throne room of Bright Moon that She-Ra is a horde soldier, Katra talking with the other cadets going, ha, huh, princesses, they're all sparkle, no fight. And we don't have Swift Wind yet. And the show's called She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. In the trailer, they say, we want to revive the Princess Alliance, which is an excuse to travel around and find other princesses to complete the toy set. <laughs> but I must say uh, one thing. A lot of the shows nowadays to sell toys are a lot better than the shows I watched when I was younger to sell toys. Because I went back and watched those and went, I, I, I like this. Uh, one, we were younger. Two, we didn't have anything better. Also, there's that whole collective unconscious thing where, like, oh, yeah, remember that thing that happened in this show? Go back and watch it. It never happened? But you remember that too, right? Yeah. Is this like that Bernstein Sparrows thing? With the Mandala effect, man? Is it, is it like that? <laughs> That's, well, that was another thing. Back to Thundercats, because you talk to people who watch Thundercats, you go, oh yeah, remember that? Oh yeah, that was cool. Go back and watch the show. That never happened. That never happened. <laughs> it's not there. Very few 80s shows still hold up when you go back and watch them. Very few. Can you name one? Not right now, but I remember watching one recently and going, hey, that's better than I thought it was. Because it's like, I remember liking it when I was younger. Watch it again. Oh, I actually still like this one. A lot of the ones I'm like, I like it, but... Wow, I did a lot of filling in. Yeah. Though you have to wonder about things like that when we all came up with the same things. Was that in some way superior? Because it engaged our creativity. Hmm. Myself, it still engages my creativity because I'm still trying to figure out what they're planning on doing with the plot. Though I'm older now. When I was younger... Especially if I, I felt like the hero wasn't doing his job, I would usually come up with my own hero who did the job better. Most of Lux's characters tend to be a bit OP and they have to be dialed back a bit. Yeah, because I was like, the hero should have been, I mean, really, you're not, sit down, you're not doing your job. <laughs> Look, tag team, tag me in. Come on, I got this. <laughs> come on, you're being an idiot. Obviously, that's the bad guy right over there. Not that, that one. <laughs> Uh, but there's definitely lots of promises, little things that I think they're definitely hitting at. Also, they can go far with Bo. There's a lot of stuff that can go with him, especially if they start pulling him back and start giving him reasons why he's so off the wall, so much energy. Because right now he feels a little bit shallow because he's always like at 10 yeah, so we need to see him dialed back so that we can actually see his personality and some of the reasoning. Yeah, there was two instances where we actually saw like the more serious version of him, or at least the calmer version. One, where he was picking up the clothes, mm -hmm. and two was the speech. Because there were sparkles in that girl's eyes, and I'm so I'm like, are they hinting at something? Or is it, because I have a feeling Bo has no idea what he just did there, other than support! Well, he wasn't even expecting the reaction he got. We need a door. Say so what now? I was just trying to give you a pep talk. You you want to go find the Horde girl? Okay, I trust you. Because I think he was like, I'm going to give you a pep talk. Why are you leaving? I need to do this. Okay, trust me. I always trust you. I'm just not quite sure about you, but I always trust you. <laughs> he even says that when they're like going through the forest. So should we wrap things up? Probably. But I want to know more about the whispering woods and all the different species we're seeing because the civilians of Thamor were humanoid, not human. It also gives reason for Catra to be the way she is in this series. Well, they also had a lizard type creature as a cadet as well. And if we switch to Eternia instead of Etheria, there were all sorts of animal type sentient humanoid creatures there. Oh yeah, like Beastman, I believe his name was. Camera, he was like the big orange fuzzy guy. Because I actually, now that I'm like really thinking about it, I was like, I actually wouldn't mind seeing He Man in this style. Because I want to see how they would handle his body form. I'm thinking more Bruce Lee than uh, pumping iron. That's a, actually, uh, 
that's one quick talking about one more reboot. I actually enjoyed that He-Man reboot from like the 90s. I know you weren't too much of a fan of it, but I, I, I liked it. I just later in that series, I was like, there was literally a point where He-Man and Skeletor were fighting in invincible armor and they just got bored with it. Which is actually pretty funny. Because they both ended up with these highly ancient, basically super powered armors and they were fighting each other throughout the entire episode where other things were going on. We kept cutting back from them and back to them. And at the end of the episode, they both literally go, okay, truce, truce. This is boring, right? Yes. Both take off the armor and leave on their own volition. At the same time, they take off the armor and go, yeah. We'll, we'll fight again later? Yeah. Just not with this. <laughs> it was like, that's great. So a lot of little hints. It's interesting how they're going to fill in Adora's backstory this time. Because she's not going to be He-Man's twin sister. She's not going to have been kidnapped at birth by Lord Hordak. Which never made sense in the 80s version. Why would Hordak come to Eternia and steal one of two twins out of Cradle? Also, I would like to see the sorceress, though, over um, Light Hope. Because, yeah, Light Hope's great and everything, but I always like the sorceress's design. I know Shira almost never got to see her because she was all the way back on Eternia, but, you know, the whole feathered cape and headdress look and the ability to turn into a bird of prey much more interesting than light hope who if i remember correctly was literally just a light that kind of like one of those sound sensor speakers pulsed yes that suddenly reminded me of a little creature from tron it was called a bit and all it did was go yes no and it kind of flashed and changed shape mm-hmm because Light Hope was kind of the bit, one of the big, oh, I can tell you information relevant to the plot, but finding the hidden castle that was, you know, the hidden castle where Light Hope was, was Shira's special place, and nobody could see it clearly, and the foretelling was that nobody could see it clearly until the Horde was defeated once and for all. Hmm, interesting. And now time to wrap things up. I don't know how long it's going to be for you, audience, but it's been a while. Just a bit. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our thoughts on She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Season 1, Episodes 1 and 2. Oh, hey, glad to see you here. Remember, Sasami-chan, don't leave any spoilers in the comments. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for watching our show. If you'd like to help support this channel, please subscribe, ring the bell, all the usual YouTube stuff, comment below. All that fun stuff. Oh, you want to watch more of our content? Hey, we've got playlists. As we mentioned before, there's links down below to our reading of the She-Ra Golden Books. Very enjoyable. There's some off-model designs going on in those books. Kind of fun. Oh, you want to support us directly? Hey, that's cool. You can do that through a commission. That's giving me some money with an idea of yours. I take your idea. I craft it using my digital art skills and send it back to you. Isn't that wonderful? Or you can come over to my Patreon and you can leave a comment somewhere. Or if you pay a dollar, you can vote on polls. That's a dollar a month. And you can see some of your comments turn into art. Isn't that cool? Or you can just donate three bucks through coffee. K-O-F-I. Fun place through PayPal. One time thing. Oh, and if you just want to see the art, non-time lapse you can go to the links down below for my tumblr deviantart twitter pick your favorite social network of choice go there follow me it's awesome and i think i've done with the spiel now over to amber thank you so much for watching and listening we appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views likes comments dialogue suggestions and of course financially as well but all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.